people at the back hear me? Great, thank you. I, I'd like to start by apologising um, for being late. I left the hotel um, 70 minutes ago and I've been on an unguided tour of the University, National University of Singapore for about 45 to 50 minutes. Uh, it would have helped if I'd known the name of the location I was coming to, but uh, I neglected to put that into my notes, so I'm very sorry for holding you up this morning. Uh, professor Tan Eng Chi, uh, Associate Professor Associate Professor Chung Hong Hoon, uh, Associate Professor Daphne Pan, delegates, colleagues and friends. Uh, good morning and thank you very much for the opportunity to provide a brilliant lecture on uh, <laughs> interdisciplinary epistemology. A colleague said to me yesterday I should explain to you that uh, I'm not talking about any surgical procedures, but I'm sure you understand that. I'm delighted to be here at the 2008 International Teaching and Learning Conference at the National University of Singapore. I visited NUS last year and spent a wonderful half day with Daphne Pan talking about teaching and learning and uh, I'd like to thank Huang Hun for making me feel so welcome when I've come back this year. I'd like to start my uh, presentation by th acknowledging and thanking my colleague at the University of Melbourne, Dr Martin Davies. It's uh, work that Martin and I have undertaken together that forms uh, the basis of much of my presentation today. The theme of our conference is frontiers in higher education and I think interdisciplinarity is a frontier. We visited it briefly in the 1970s, uh, but I think we retreated from it somewhat and there's been a recent resurgence in interest in this less, slightly less charted territory. I'm going to talk a little bit about each of the topics listed here. I'll, I'll talk very briefly about each of them. Uh, we have a very short time and even less because I'm late, I think. Um, so just very briefly about the place of interdisciplinarity in higher education. I'll then discuss very briefly the variance of disciplinarity, cross-disciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, and I'll try not to confuse myself and all of you with me. Uh, I'll then talk about some of the pedagogical challenges inherent in interdisciplinarity. And then I've chosen just four learning theories uh, or ideas about learning to, to touch on. The limit of four is mainly for time reasons, but also because, as we'll see, the four I've chosen, I think, have something to offer in interdisciplinary settings. And I'll very briefly consider, and I hope you will with me, which might be best for interdisciplinary context, and I'll be very interested in hearing your comments and discussion. So big topics such as these two given as, as examples are, are global topics in that they're of interest and relevance to the international community. And such big topics are difficult, if not impossible, to study and research from a single disciplinary perspective. As the world becomes more connected and integrated in terms of managing areas of mutual concern to us all, I think interdisciplinarity has an increasingly important central place in higher education. We need not only graduates who can work and, and have knowledge and expertise in disciplinary areas, but also graduates who can work across and within disciplines outside their own and work effectively and engage with colleagues who see things differently to the way that they do. Here's the bit that's potentially confusing, or it is to me at least. What are the variants of disciplinarity? Well, first we have multidisciplinarity. And I think multidisciplinarity is really a term that describes a set of circumstances. While students normally specialise in one discipline, they can study several over the course of a typical undergraduate degree program. For example, in addition to count accounting subjects, an accounting student also might study some finance subjects and some economic subjects, and po possibly even other subjects such as history or music. Multidisciplinarity has been described uh, as simply the view that everyone does th his or her own thing, with little or no necessity for anyone to be aware of what anyone else is doing. So it's simply the, the coexistence of a number of disciplines. It's what typically exists in higher education degrees. Then we have cross-disciplinarity, which uh, Martin Davies and I have described as peering into another discipline. Uh, cross-disciplinarity is often terminologically confused with interdisciplinarity, but it's where a topic normally outside the field of study is investigated, with no cooperation from others in the area of study concerned. So two examples might be the physics of music or the politics of literature. While sometimes informative and interesting, this type of inquiry involves the use of essentially foreign techniques and tools from those normally used to study the phenomenon under consideration. There is rarely, rarely any transfer of methodologies in cross-disciplinary work. Taking one of the examples above, 
musicians don't necessarily learn any physics, and physics may not, physicists may not learn much about music. Then we move to interdisciplinarity, and here things are more subtle and nuanced, uh, and there are variants of interdisciplinarity, Martin and I believe, that range from benign to radical. Let's start at the benign end. So at one end of the continuum is a number of elective subjects that relate to a topic, for example, women's studies. This variant is, to me, very similar to multidisciplinarity, except that the multiple subjects are somehow related to a topic, but it is understood in the literature as interdisciplinarity. If we move one spot along the continuum, here we have a, a place where discipline boundaries are entrenched, yet the possibility of mutual critique is left open. This variant might merely imply critique and the critical exchange of views while maintaining disciplinary integrity. integrity. Moving further along again to the third point, we see integration and or modification of the sub-contributions while an inquiry is proceeding. Different participants need to take into account the contributions of their colleagues in order to make their own contribution. So we see an increasing integration of the disciplines with this variant. At the next stage of the continuum, we have two or more disciplines combining their expertise to jointly, jointly address an area of common concern. This is known as pluridisciplinarity. There'll be an exam on this at the end, by the way. <laughs> this usually arises in areas of study where the topic under investigation is too complex for a simple dis single discipline to address. Examples include the AIDS pandemic and climate change, as mentioned earlier, the water crisis in Australia, global warming, and so on. Topics such as these require coordinated efforts of many specialists to manage, and in higher education, the study of these requires the same. And finally, moving to the radical end of the continuum, we see the collapse of academic boundaries and the emergence of new disciplines. And Max Neef has called this transdisciplinarity. So, very quick, quick and dirty tour of the variants of disciplinarity. Let's move now to some of the pedagogical considerations within interdisciplinarity. Uh, I think the two major ones are those two, dissonant and different cognitive maps, ways of seeing and ways of knowing, and the issue of disciplinary language. I'll talk about each of those in turn. In terms of cognitive maps and models, within each discipline there is a way of viewing the world. These ways are also known as cognitive maps or models. Members of a discipline community understand the world in terms of the cognitive models they possess. They see things differently from the ways in which members of other disciplinary communities see things. And many of you will have had experiences of talking to colleagues from other disciplines who just don't seem to understand what you're talking about, and vice versa. Martin Davies and I have noted that in the normal course of events in higher education, students learn a disciplinary cognitive map and model when they're inducted into a discipline. Once this happens, it becomes difficult for them to see things in other ways. There are strong theoretical and methodological bases to these views of reality and about how to think about and investigate reality. In interdisciplinary settings, we must think about how to introduce students to multiple cognitive maps. Very challenging. On the issue of language, within disciplinary context, there are also strong linguistic preferences in terms of both the language used to discuss matters and in terms of the meanings of vocabulary and language. Martin and I point to the example of the word mass and its different meanings to, for example, an architect and a physicist as one small example of the differences that are potentially evident in interdisciplinary settings. And if there are differences in the use of single words, the potential differences in understanding of theoretical concepts might be vast. Such differences have huge implications pedagogically. Martin and I argue it's as important to teach the language and technical terms of each discipline, as it is to teach the methodologies, procedures and concepts. We argue further that these cannot be taught without the language. So how does one do this in interdisciplinary study? And who is responsible for ensuring it occurs? I'm not going to answer either of those questions because they're too hard. They're for you to think about. Some other Pedagogical considerations are assessment and tutor training and rewarding and disciplinary and interdisciplinary efforts. I won't say much here except care needs to be taken in setting and marking assessment tasks or questions in interdisciplinary settings. And that's an understatement, I think. If the staff member setting the assessment task or exam question has disciplinary biases, 
in terms of what is important in an assignment, or biases about what cognitive model should be used in answering an assignment question or an exam question, even if those preferences are unconscious. This may privilege students from some disciplinary backgrounds and disadvantage others. A related issue is that if those marking the assignments or exams are from different disciplinary backgrounds to that of the subject or unit coordinator, the person who set the assessment, the issues of cognitive maps and of language can also create significant challenges in terms of fairness and consistency in grading. The training of tutors or teacher assistants must be undertaken very thoroughly and carefully in order to manage these challenges and to minimise the risks to the quality of interdisciplinary teaching and learning. The area of preparing higher education teachers for interdisciplinary teaching is fertile ground where much work is needed. One further issue that needs some comment, I think, is the matter of rewarding interdisciplinary efforts on the part of staff. Purposeful and directed interdisciplinary work requires an appropriate institutional system of rewards, support, promotion, seed funding, release time, teaching and innovation grants and so on. But these rewards need to be directed at interdisciplinary work. At present, of course, the principal rewards for academic staff at most universities are by means of disciplinary channels, publication in top-tier disciplinary journals, advancement of one's discipline, teaching awards for teaching undertaken in a discipline, and so on. Although this may be beginning to change with the uh, recent emergence of a growing number of interdisciplinary journals. But staff will naturally put their efforts where the rewards are available. Under the typical reward circumstances for staff I've just described, interdisciplinary work may not flourish, and the frontier that we are gently reinvestigating in higher education may recede yet again. So we turn our attention now to the four theories of learning I've chosen, constructivism, situated learning, experiential learning and phenomenography. I chose four, as I said, in the interests of time, but also because I think these four are well known and they have something to offer in interdisciplinary settings. There are, of course, many other ideas and theories about learning with which you'll be familiar. I'll outline each of these very briefly, and I warn you it is very briefly, um, and then comment again very briefly on their, on their relevance to aspects of interdisciplinary epistemology. As many of you will be aware, in contrast to the more traditional notion of teaching as the transmission and reception of a discrete body of knowledge passed from teacher to student, constructivist epistemology contends that learning is an active process in which learners construct new ideas and concepts for themselves based on their current and past knowledge. In terms of university teaching, the lecturer or tutor encourages students to learn and discover principles themselves and to use dialogue with others to achieve this. And I was delighted yesterday when Professor Gibbs talked to us about the importance of talking, students talking to each other in order to learn. The second theory, situated learning, this uh, builds on the idea that learning is normally a function of the activity and the context and the culture in which it occurs. That is, it is situated. Social interaction, again, is a critical component of situated learning, and learners are thought to become part of a community of practice. The theory of situated learning contends that knowledge needs to be presented authentically in settings and through applications that would normally involve that knowledge, and that learning requires social interaction and collaboration. And Graham Gibbs yesterday gave us several case studies that illustrated the power of interaction and collaboration. Experiential learning is based on the notion that ideas are changeable and can be formed and reformed through experience. Experiential learning or learning by doing is based on constructivism and recognises that experience plays a central role in learning. Rogers and Freeberg suggest the characteristics of experiential learning include self-initiation of the learning on the part of the student and personal involvement in the learning. The role of the teacher is to facilitate such learning through clarifying purposes for the learners, creating a positive learning environment and providing necessary resources. And phenomenography, often grouped with learning theories, phenomenography is actually a research method that investigates how people experience phenomena. In terms of ideas about learning that have emerged from this phenomenography, the focus is on the experience of learning from the student's perspective. Phenomenography highlights the fact that there are many multiple understandings of reality. So which one is best? 
interdisciplinary teaching and learning in higher education incorporates multiple ways of knowing. As interdisciplinary pe pedagogies become increasingly important in a global knowledge economy, which one is best for teaching and learning and practice in these endeavours? Well, I think the four that I've chosen would all seem to offer something in terms of framing pedagogical approaches to interdisciplinary teaching and learning. Constructivism, for example, recognises that students need to build their understanding of concepts, and such building is critical when a number of ways of knowing and seeing are relevant as they are in interdisciplinary settings. The social interaction central to the theory of situated learning is a necessary component of building knowledge, particularly if knowledge is construed from different perspectives. And dialogue may be critical for students to clarify and confirm their understanding in these settings. Experiential ideas point to the benefit of learning by doing. And it's likely that the application, in some way at least, of the multiple perspectives that interdisciplinarity encompasses may help students understand the contribution and way of seeing of each discipline to the exploration of an issue. Finally, phenomenography reminds us of the centrality of the student experience in learning. Phenomenography also highlights the fact that there are different understandings of reality, and so it appears highly relevant to interdisciplinary pedagogy. So the answer is all four, none of the above. It'll be in the exam. Each may offer something. It depends what you think about learning. And of course, if we took very different learning theories to the ones that I've chosen, we would get different answers, I think. Perhaps there's no one right set of answers. And uh, which theory is best for interdisciplinary epistemology may be based on underlying beliefs and therefore is open to opinion and differences of opinion. I'm sorry if that conclusion disappoints some of you, but that's my conclusion. There may be personal preferences depending on your objectives and your underlying conceptions of how students learn in interdisciplinary contexts. I thank you for your attention. I've done well on the time and I look forward to comments and questions. Thank you.